Welcome. Welcome to Wealth Wizards. <laughs> so, um, I recently started uh, another course. Uh, you may remember I was talking about the machine learning course that I was doing on Coursera. Um, so, we finished that one. And uh, I started another one on Udacity. I don't know whether you've come across the Udacity platform, but it's a, a really good um, platform where they, they give loads of... Um, they, they, they train on lots of different topics. Actually, I'll stay on here. Um, and they, so they teach mainly technical stuff, but they've got this concept of a nano degree, which is kind of a longer course that takes three to six months. Um, and you pay for it, you know, it's maybe 800 quid or something like that. And you, um, but the, instru the instructors are like famous people in, in the field. Um, and so I've, I've just started uh, an AI nano degree. It takes about six months. It's about like 16 hours a week. And it looks like it's going to be really interesting. And a couple of my heroes from the AI world are teaching the course, which is pretty fun. Um, so I've just finished the first week and started the second week. And in the first week, we, we wrote some stuff to solve a Sudoku. Um, and in, in the blurb, it says we, we've written an AI to solve a Sudoku. It's not, I don't feel like it's fully AI yet. But what we've def definitely done is taken some of, the, some of the key strategies that you use within artificial intelligence and applied them to solve a Sudoku. Um, so I just thought I'd share that with you uh, today. Um, so it's called constraint propagation. I, I assume that everybody here has had a go at solving Sudoku's before. Um, I'm not particularly good at them. Uh, the algorithm I wrote is a lot better than me uh, at solving these. But the you know the, the the idea is that you've got to fit the numbers one to nine exactly once into each column, row, and square. And um, they they set as an extra challenge at the end to see if we could also get it so that uh, it, they fit in the diagonals uh, as well, which is which is nice. So the way the way that this is represented um, to the uh, to the algorithm is um, what we did was we we filled we, we created this uh, dictionary structure um, where you've got this is a one this is a two a three etc and where where the, the cells are empty where you know we as humans like to see the cells as empty um, what we've done is we've we've populated the empty the empty fields with the the per, the, the options for that box. Um, so that, that's fixed, but you can put any number one to nine in there at the moment. And the, the, the typical thing that you do um, in AI, your first port of call, the first spanner that comes out of the bag, is, uh, is search. And you can have breadth first search or depth first searches, you know, as you know. If you were to, if, and, and we have used search to, to solve this, um, depth first, so DFS. Um, but the thing is, if you were to go wading in there with search straight away, um, then why it would, it would take it would take longer than you're prepared to wait. You know, something like seventy five million years. Or so it would take a long time. Um, and um, the reason is is just because that search space is too big at the moment. So imagine if, if you were to go in there and um, uh, and say right, well, look, what are the options here? The options are one to nine. Let's just choose one. Let's choose one. That's that's like being uh, standing standing in in the forest and you've got nine different paths out in, in front of you. You choose one of those paths and you go down there and you see, does this get me out of the forest or not? Let's say it's not a forest, it's a maze. So you go down there and say, does this one door lead me to, to the end of the maze or not? Um, but then quite quickly you come up to another door which is represented by this next cell where you've also got nine branching uh, paths that you can take. So you choose, well, let's choose one of those, let's choose one. And you keep going down until you either come to the exit or you come to a dead end. Um, and let, let's see, in, let, let's suppose that in this first instance I did choose one. Um, would this get me to the exit or would it get me to the dead end? Dead end. Dead end. So why, why is that? There's already a one in that block. Yeah. So we'd, we'd get as far as we could through solving the Sudoku, quite a long way through solving the Sudoku, and then realise, oh, we shouldn't have put one in there. Okay, roll back. So you have to roll all the way back up to the top. Um, and then say, well, let's let all of those alternate futures where... Uh, where Biff was president and where we chose one. Let's discard that, that alternate future and go for an alternate future where we had two and they go all the way through this, you know, branching, branching, branching at every step. And there's, you imagine if, if, you, if you were to just generate numbers at random in here between one and nine, there's this many different permutations. Um, so there's th this, this many valid Sudoku solutions, which, you know, it's quite a lot. It's like 70 thousand, million, trillion or something, uh, in, in a search space of, let's say, what, what is that, like 81 factorial, which is you know, more like 10 to the 120. So all very, very big numbers, 
bigger numbers than, than we can possibly deal with with just search. But what's interesting is that we're not generating numbers just from scratch. We've got these anchors which are helping us out. And what are these? Well, these, these kind of represent things that you can't have. They represent constraints. And the constraints are really useful in, uh, in making that search space smaller. So we did, we did use search. And here's, here's the search um, algorithm that, that we used. You can see it's recursive. Um, so it's written in Python, which is like the, you know, that's the, the language of choice for machine learning and AI. But what we're doing here on this line is we're saying, okay, so, so let's, let's take a copy of the, of the puzzle as it is at the moment, change one cell, and change one cell to, instead of being the numbers one to nine to be, to be the number one. And then, then let's go recurse through this and go down that again, you know, walk down that branching path to see whether we come up with um, false, which is, okay, there's no solution, it's a dead end, or whether we get to a, to a point where all of the boxes have only got one number in, in which case that's the solution. Yes, we win. That's the end. So that, that's the bare bones search algorithm. Um, but the problem is that we're faced with this massively branching problem, which would just take probably millions of years to solve. So this is where constraint propagation comes in. We use the constraints to make the search space smaller, and to reduce the size of options, that, the, the number of options that we've got to consider, and therefore make the problem tractable, whereas before it was intractable. Um, and the, and we, we used the, the strategies that you use will be specific to the domain that, you, that you're working in. And in Sudoku, uh, we've, we've got things like, well, if you've got a seven in this box, then none of these other things can be seven. Wow, so that's just, that's just rubbed out a whole load of things that you, you know, those are all branches that in themselves, you know, what, what's that, um, nine, 18, plus some other stuff here, 20 odd different permutations. Um, roots of trees that you now no, no longer need to no longer need to search. Um, so in this one, you, you, know, you just go and choose one at random and then say, uh, well, if there's a seven in here, then let's, let's remove seven from all of these options. So where we've got the, um, we, we, we got, we've got this representation of the puzzle in, in mind. We're going to go and delete all of the sevens from here, all of the sevens from there, and all of the sevens from this, from this box. And that makes the, the puzzle smaller. We've then got another constraint. Um, which is that if we, we loop through all of the numbers and see, well, okay, let's, let's select one, for example. If there's a one anywhere here, or there's one anywhere here, or there's one anywhere in this box, then this number um, can't be one. But if, if, those, if, the, if these are devoid of one, then that can only be one. That's the only choice. And if you, what we did was we just iterated around these two things um, for a few nanoseconds. Um, and that all of a sudden turned it from being a problem which would take longer than our lunch break to solve, you know, maybe millions of years to solve, to being something that is solved in a couple of milliseconds. Um, so we, we, just, we just loop around these two things, eliminate only choice, eliminate only choice, um, until, until, we, until we stall, until we arrive at a place where, okay, those two strategies themselves are not moving us on, along any further. And then we run search on, on the result on a much, much smaller um, thing. Um, so that just just those two those two constraints by themselves um, solved most Sudoku's. Um, some Sudoku's are still quite big after you know there's still lots of permutations left. Um, maybe because you start with a, a puzzle that that doesn't have many of the blanks filled in. So it, it by you know in in essence it's a hard puzzle. So the, there's this other strategy that that we came up with called Naked Twins. Um, I don't know if you ever use this one when you're when you're using when you're doing Sudoku's yourself, but if you don't know, if there's not an only choice here and there's not an only choice there, but you know that this can only be a two or a three and that can only be a two or a three, then that means that everything else in this, the, in, in the unit where these two live can no longer be a two or a three. So we remove two and three from there, we remove three from there, and that, you know, then that itself probably kick-starts the process again. So we can go around only choice and eliminate and only choice and eliminate for a while. And, and so what we end up with is this, um, is this function reduce puzzle, which just um, loops around this stuff until it can't go any further. Um, and that makes, that makes the problem much, much smaller. So this, this reduce puzzle thing, where, which runs eliminate, only choice, naked twins, and then sees whether it's made any progress or not. And if it has, it goes around again. Um, we run that as part of our search. So this is that original search function again. 
but just running reduce puzzles first. And so that actually I probably should have run this before uh, <coughs> before sitting down. But that's just solved. Oh, you can't see it. That's good. I was just going to show you it actually running. Never mind that. <laughs> so this is this is it solving. The, the unit test is running three different Sudoku puzzles. And you can see that it runs it in uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.04 of a second, solving three three Sudokus. Um, so just that that reduction, you know, made made all the difference. So that's um, that's constraint propagation, and the the idea is that you 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 take. Um, you take advantage of the things that you can't do to make the search space smaller, and this this is um, it's been very useful in Sudoku. But chess is far worse than Sudoku because every um, every turn that you take has got maybe it's got a branching factor of maybe fifty, um, and then on average there are about a hundred turns you know in chess games. So you can imagine that's um, hundred to the fifty. Is it different possible permutations? Which is yeah, Sims nodding. No, he's not nodding. It's you know it's it's fifty to the hundred or hundred to hundred to the fifty, so it's large. And then goes even worse. Goes just chronic, um, because you know look how many, look how many squares there are, and look uh, you know look at how few constraints there are in that uh, you know in that game. So, the constraint propagation is used a lot in in AI to to make the search space smaller. Um, so that when, when you actually run the search algorithm, there are far fewer things to, to choose between. And this is used in all sorts of things from like self-driving cars that have to find their way from, from A to B. And there's, you know, you imagine you're trying to drive from here to uh, Windsor. Let's say there are so many different routes that you could take. Even just coming out of here, you need to choose whether you go left or you go right. You know, and, and when you get to the end of that road, you need to choose, do I go left or do I go right? And that roundabout over there has got four different exits from it, so many permutations. How does an AI reduce that down? Well, it's by using constraint propagation. Cheers. Wow. Any questions? Oh, not from Sim. OK, ask an easy one. Uh, I was just going to ask a question I had in my mind. OK. Is, um, so this talks about artificial intelligence, but it seems like all of the intelligence came from you and a lot of hard thinking about Okay, what are the rules? How do I? What What are the rules I can use to make this problem simpler? Mm. <clears throat> and that feels like very traditional programming, um, in the sense of okay, how would I solve this problem? Make the computer do that. I saw the hard part being okay. You've got you stall and you have this this deep search to do. Um, and the way your program solved that was just by going a depth by search through all the possibilities, which doesn't feel. Um, that feels like the hard part. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering. I'm wondering where the artificial intelligence is in this. Is, is, is yeah, this no, that, that's that's correct. Yeah. Um, so, so I, as as I said at the beginning, this this doesn't this is not really artificial intelligence yet. This is just um, them introducing us to some of the strategies that we can use in artificial intelligence. Um, you would expect if it was intelligent for it to kind of work out what the algorithm is by itself, um, and that's that's where the deep learning side of things comes in. So in, in deep learning, you use things like neural networks to, to derive the algorithm for themselves. Um, but if you, if, you, if you just go in to, to just say, well, just work it out for yourself, then, then the search space will probably be too big. Um, so we would, um, in this, this week, we're writing um, a game. We're writing an AI that can beat us at a game which is a bit like um, Norton Crosses, um, but harder than Norton Crosses. And in, in that, we're using a mix of both deep learning and constraint propagation. So you're right, that, that itself is not learning. We're having to do a lot of the work ourselves. If you want to see real learning in action, um, there's, there's, uh, there's an amazing uh, website called, uh, well, YouTube channel called Two Minute Papers, where this, this guy who's got quite a big personality goes, he reads all of the papers to do with AI that are being published every week, takes the interesting ones and then makes a two minute video about it. Um, and there's, there's some stuff in there where you can, in natural language, say to the AI, show me a bird that's got like a red short beak and um, yellow tufts on its feathers. 
and the AI will generate that even though it's never seen a bird like that before. It will just generate it and it looks to you and I like, like a real bird. Um, so that, that's something called generative adversarial networks, which is just crazy amazing. Um, and what, what, what's exciting about that is, is that all of this tech is brand new. You know, these, these, these papers are, are maybe nine months old. Um, so AI is a field that, that is still very much at the beginning of its exponential rise. Cool. All right. Thanks for stopping by. See you next time. <laughs>